Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Iowa-Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Kiyosakwa, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Hi, Joel. We got a very special guest with us today, uh, Jim Coffey from uh, the Iowa DNR. But before we get into uh, talking about Jim, let's let's talk about a little bit about what we've been doing, and we haven't done that for a while. So I'm going to kick off kick off with that. Uh, maybe share off share a little dumbass moment that <laughs> that I've been doing. So I. Uh, Part of what I did is we went through that real cold spell, and I'd been uh, feeding the deer just to kind of get a survey and try to augment augment their food supply. And one day it was so cold. I mean, it was so cold, and I was wearing my uh, I was wearing sunglasses. I had a smock around. I had a hat, and uh, amongst everything else. And when I get on my ATV, I mean, I, it comes with a uh, seat belt but i don't normally put the seat belt on i just put it right behind it because it's regulated and and i generally i'm only going five seven miles an hour almost all the time anyway and uh anyway i've i took my uh my sunglasses were um fogging up really bad and uh anyway i went to reach for my sunglasses and my atv swerved down into a culvert and I went, I went right over the steering wheel. And I was only going, I, I swear, like four to five miles an hour. And I tell you this story because I have a new appreciation <laughs> for seatbelts. And uh, my ribs, so it's been four weeks right now. And my ribs today are still sore. So uh, for our listeners, and if you want to get a good chuckle out of my dumbass moments, there you go. But uh, seatbelts are very important. I've talked to Can Am and suggest maybe they put an airbag in those. Oh, once in a while, huh? I'm so. telling you. I, of course, I went to ask my wife if she would have came looked for me if I would have rolled it, and she said probably not. <laughs> so, <laughs> be crawling back to the house. So the other thing we've been doing is uh, we've been doing some CRP burning, and uh, so there's some dumbass moments there, right? I mean. I'll let you kind of go in if yeah, you want I mean, to talk to that. You help me. I think the message there is as safe as you possibly can be. It still can, it can still backfire on you, right? So, uh, yeah, we were, we thought a one-day job turned into three days because the first day was just literally chasing fires, right? Just kind of got away from us. Uh, it got into some fuel that we didn't think existed there and then wanted to keep it out of the woods. And, uh, man, and then you're, but, but you start, you start getting really tired. You know what tired means when you can't lift a shovel or break a, rake it rake the field away so yeah that's scary that matted brome was like a match super scary super scary but we learned from it thank god we learned from it and uh you know day two went better and day three was awesome yep and it's done that's the most important thing right tim yep it is and uh we we documented most of it so we'll we'll show you what we did minus the dumbass moment yeah maybe burning is like painting it's all in the prep work if you're prepared, it can go well, but if you're not prepared, it can go bad really fast. We thought we were prepared. That was the yeah. problem. We didn't know, and uh, we, we are now, so that's for sure. <laughs> you're right. You're exactly right, though. It's all in the preparation, the breaks, and yeah. et cetera. Watching your wind, watching your humidity, being prepared, having everything there. And then what you realize is that 
when you're repaired, it doesn't hurt as much because you don't have to do it for three days. Yeah, exactly. So now it's the second time I've heard humidity, but uh, yeah. I wouldn't say we were paying attention to the humidity. Uh, humidity changes drastically throughout the day. And so you've really got to be monitoring that humidity. And then you've got to kind of be predicting and look at some of the weather channels that are out there or weather apps that are out there um, because it can change so quickly that you might start a burn at 10 in the morning thinking, now this is going to be fine. And then by you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, that humidity's changed, and now your fuel load has changed, and how you have to adapt to it has changed um, very quickly. Um, now, that's where your fire breaks come in very handy because, or if you're doing a backfire versus a head fire, some of those other techniques that you're using can be work to your favor. But um, you never want to start a fire at 3 o'clock on a Saturday with a 35 mile an hour wind because it's just like pouring gasoline on the ground. Nope. Yep. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, Tim, I, I've been uh, really getting a chainsaw out, so I'm kind of happy with the work I've been doing uh, the last couple weeks. Um, I cut up a couple trees for the neighbor and, and got that ready for, you know, firewood around the fire uh, ring this summer, so that was nice. Helped them out, helped me out. But the biggest thing is sitting in a tree stand. I don't when you're sitting in a tree stand, you're thinking about, man, it'd be nice to get this limb cut or... Man, I could cut this tree down and get so much more light to the ground or whatever. So I added about 30, 20 to 30% more to a food plot, a kill plot that I had in the woods. And uh, kind of cut some TSI, some uh, elm and some other crappy trees and pushed them into a pile that existed. And my plan is, is to go in there with my tiller and till that up and, and plant some food plot material in there. That'll be a great so spot. Super excited about that. And that every winter there's always a tree or two that fall across your logging road so doing a little cleanup so just nice to be outside and not freezing your your butt off you know sure so okay but with that let's uh let's introduce our guest here um jim coffee jim you're with the iowa dnr you want to tell folks yeah. who you are and what you specialize in yeah. so i'm the forest wildlife biologist for the iowa dnr um, work out of the sheraton research station and the primary responsibility being forest wildlife species being mostly deer or excuse me turkey is a turkey coordinator but work on deer as well um, rough grouse squirrels mostly those species associated with a forest habitat um, and then i of course i work with our forestry department our forestry staff and our wildlife areas um, giving them recommendations when they ask me questions about what they can do. And I'm here for the general public um, to ask questions as well. And you've been at this a long time. This will be my 25th year. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah. Impressive. Impressive. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about turkey habitat. Mm -hmm. And maybe before we get into turkey habitat, can you kind of educate us about, you know, what do turkeys need to survive mm -hmm. uh, food water you know uh, yeah I like to break I like to break turkeys down into their life cycle of because it changes throughout the year um, and so when we talk about that we tar start to when we talk to private landowners about what they want to do is we try to look at what the limiting factor is the one thing that you're not providing on your landscape that you can provide in your landscape that might make your your numbers or your habitat a little more conducive to having better numbers what usually ends up happening though is that we have to realize this is a species that can walk quite a bit in a day and can fly if they have to and so you're probably in most cases not going to contain them just on your property so you have to look at that landscape level of what else is out there and it might be that turkeys um, almost like a yarding effect of deer out east is in the winter time they will move to an area and get into big flocks so it might be that you provide the the nesting habitat or the fall habitat but you don't provide the winter habitat and those turkeys can distribute themselves three or four miles come next spring so you might not see turkeys on your property in january but they're there in april and may that's because they were somewhere else during the winter time so we have to think about those perspectives a little bit bigger than the average landowner would but the, the nice thing about turkeys is they're very much a generalistic species and that's what got us in trouble as turkey biologists um, 40, 50 years ago, is turkeys were only seen as being a big deep woods species down in the south. And, and as, as emerging turkey biologists, because there was no such thing as a turkey biologist and we didn't have turkeys, is we looked at where turkeys were at and said, well, they're, here they are. They're in the bogs of Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas. That must be turkey habitat. And if you fast forward now and think back, it's we had pressured turkeys so much, that was the last places that turkeys were surviving. 
they survived well in the rest of the landscape, but we had persecuted them so much that this was the place where it was hard to get to them. And then we took that as that's good turkey habitat. So we introduced them into Stevens Forest and Shimmick State Forest and Yellow River State Forest, thinking those were the biggest habitats that we had. That'll be the best habitat. And what we found out, because of the generalistic species they are, they love that mixture. They love timber with pasture, with row crop, with shrubs and weeds and messy things. They do really well. And that's Iowa. That's southern Iowa. We have all those habitats close by, close proximity. They can move from season to season through those. And that's why we in northern Missouri have some of these great turkey numbers uh, that the rest of the country really wants. So, so Jim, does do they like uh, CRP? I mean, is CRP good for turkeys? It, it is and it isn't. Um, it's, it's a tall grass species. If you've been out burning, you realize how tall Indian grass and big bluegrass and stuff is. They'll use that. But what we know about those those habitats too, especially from pheasants and quail standpoint, is they hold a lot of moisture. And so you think, wow, this is a great habitat because I can't see through it. But it's if you've tried to walk through that stuff, especially in early spring, at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, it's still wet. Imagine being a poult or a chick this big and you're trying to weasel your way through that stuff and you're wet all the time. But at the same time, if if it's good nesting habitat, but it's close to good root habitat, habitat where they can get nest in it but get out of it, now you've provided something and you provided something else. But just that itself, probably not the best. Okay. But we have a lot of that on our landscape, especially in southern Iowa, because we converted a lot of those poor productive soils, farming soils, to CRP and to CRP grasses. That's why you see a lot of push now to put those into forbs or into shorter grass species and reduce the amount of Indian grass and big blue stem and those big, thick, dense species that we like to see burn because they burn really well right. um, into a more structured, diverse habitats that are out there. Mm-hmm. Food sources yeah. um, for the habitat? So. Changes very mm-hmm. much seasonally. Okay. So a pulp being born um, grows almost doubles every two or three days. Wow. A lot wow. of protein. Got to eat a lot of insects. They're not going to get that from greens. They've got to get that from protein. And and that can be an issue because in the springtime, it's cold. When they're nesting, it can be cold. There may not be a lot of insects, but they're going to eat ants. They're going to eat a ton of spiders. Spiders are always out there. As turkey hunters, when you wake up and you see that heavy, dewy grass with all those spider webs out there, just think turkey food. It's a buffet. They're wow. eating all that. Never thought but then that's going to convert as they start to grow and they put their weight on. Then they're going to start to shift over to greens. They're going to do a lot of greens. They're always constantly scratching and picking up snails and insects and things like that. It's going to transition into the fall. We think of our traditional acorns and hickory nuts and those things. And then you're going to go through the winter, which is going to be back to greens. And in Iowa, a lot of waste grain. That's when they're going to get out those fields and scratch up waste grain. But anytime there's greens on the ground, they're going to be picking at it. They like like that. Hmm. Okay. So it changes very much seasonally. Um, From a food plot standpoint, Mm -hmm. um, are there... You know, if someone wanted to provide greens during the the summer and whatnot, is there a specific species that you'd recommend? So I'm I'm always big on the clovers, alfalfas, and things. Again, anything that's flowering, because flowers attract insects. And so you're going to bring that out. And when you start to think about agriculture, we think about grasshoppers and things like that. That's a lot of bugs. That's a lot of food real quick. So if you can get into those kinds of species that provide the flowers, provide bugs and insects, that's what they're going after. They're going to pick the they're going to pick the leaves off the alfalfa and they're going to eat that too. But what we're really using is that food plot or that food cover source to attract those other things to them that they're going to want to eat on. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So, okay. And then of course clover and alfalfa are good for deer. They're going to be consuming that and and then turkeys at that time they like that open space they like that shorter because they can see their predators they can be out there feeding with their poults and doing things so i like to i don't like to use the word food plots as much as cover plots okay that provide food so that is a it's it's a habitat that's providing a food resource but it's really about the habitat because if all of a sudden uh, a hawk or something flies over or a predator comes in that that uh, female, that hen, she can make a cluck or whatever noise that she's going to make that causes those poults to just freeze instantly that make them invisible. And if that's out in the middle of a bare field, you know, that doesn't make life very easy. But if it's in something that they can get cover and hide, it's going to be protection for them. Yeah. And, I, and I've heard acorns or mass mm-hmm. mentioned several times. Yeah. Uh, so that just seem, that seems like something... From a landowner that you could promote. Yep, yep. So mast 
tends to be the thing we think of mostly for fall uh, as a fall food source. So your mast crop, um, which, which we would call that hard mast because it's it's an acorn versus soft mast, which would be your raspberries and, and your spongy fruity type thing. Okay. Um, it has long-term storage. It, you know, it's very capable that they can pick it up from from September all the way through next spring, depending on which species of oak it is or hickory nut. Um, and very consumable by a turkey because they have a grinding gizzard so they can eat it, store it in their crop, grain it when they need it um, throughout the day. But what we know about oaks is that they're very unpredictable in what they produce. From year to year, farm to farm, very unpredictable. So we're always going to recommend a suite of oak species of both the white oak and the red oak families because they have different cycles. Your white oaks um, are going to fall early and then they're going to start to sprout that very same year. So they're not available very long versus your red oaks are going to fall and then sprout the next year on the ground. So they're actually available all the way through. But what we know is species like deer and squirrels and other things eat those too. So yeah. if you've got an overpopulation of deer, they're going to target those acorns. And are those acorns then going to be available later in the year for other species? Yeah, for I mean, for my our property, we it's it's really a shingle oak property. I mean, mm -hmm. we have so many shingle oaks. We have some white oaks mm -hmm. and a few red oaks. But shingle so, oaks. so when I say white oaks and red oaks, I, I guess I'm I'm misspeaking. I'm talking about two families of oaks. Okay, okay. So there's a white oak family and a red oak family, and inside the white oak family, there's many species, and inside yep. the red oak family, there's many species. But they have two different biologies of how they produce. Uh, white oaks take one year to produce. They'll flower this year. They'll produce an acorn this fall. Red oaks will flower this year and then take two years for that acorn mm. to fall to the ground. Okay. The white oak, when it hits the ground, will instantly set a taproot out, and that fall you'll see a new tree. The red oak won't start until the next year. So they have two different structures, and basically they're spreading themselves out for success. Um, and so those white oaks are consumed actually very quickly, and, and they're actually sweeter so animals will go to white oaks before red oaks when they hit the ground because they're, they don't have the tannins and the flavors in them too. So just just some subtle things over time. Yeah, is, interesting. Yeah, but um, it sounds like uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, it sounds to add to it. So mm -hmm. oak having a healthy oak population is pretty important. But then greens, greens and forbs seems to be the next thing to provide year-round habitat. So if we're talking about food, if we're talking about providing food throughout the seasons and the cycles, the oaks are, are, are what we would consider that keystone species for that fall time period. The easy stuff, you know, the low-hanging fruit, for lack of a better word, it's going to hit the ground, it's going to be a bunch of it in a good production year. Um, but even in the woods in the fall, and even right now in the winter, if you pull back that snow when it was here, there's still greens under there. And there's seeps, and those turkeys are going to find those seeps and go to them. But as we move into that springtime, where we're talking about bug production, we're talking about poults that got to get, they've got three-day yolk sac. When they're hatched, they've got three days to find food or they're dead. That yolk sac is being absorbed. They've lived off of it in that egg, and it's absorbing fast. they got to get someplace that's got them food. And that protein that it comes in the form of insects provides that biggest boost. Interesting. Yeah. So those forbs are what really are going to provide that insect base. Okay. And then in the summertime, you know, dry summers especially, that's when we tend to see our big uh, grasshopper populations. And they're going to consume a lot of those because they're... Actually, the funnest time to watch them eat grasshopper is about September when it's cool at night. And the grasshoppers just can't get it going in the morning. And the turkeys will be out there picking them as fast as they can because they're not warmed up. The, the grasshoppers aren't warmed up enough to get away. Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll eat hickory nuts. Yeah, absolutely. They'll actually eat walnuts if they do. I don't, I don't see them much, but they will. Um, but hickory nuts are a good one. And what I love about hickory nuts, I'm going to get on my squirrel wagon here, is that hickory nuts are typically consistent producers. And squirrels know that. So if you're a squirrel hunter, and we all grew up, it's got to find a big oak tree. That's fine, because squirrels love acorns. But in a bad oak year, which happens probably more years than not, you've got to know where your hickory grove is. Because I will guarantee you, every squirrel on your property knows where the hickory grove is. Because he's going there to get, when times are tough. And the hickory tree, I'd like to know how many pounds of hickory nuts a hickory tree can make. Because they're... 
they're and they're filthy. just consistent filthy. and we've got several species of hickory nuts in Iowa you know as sure well. so but so it's just knowing what your woods are and having that good observational knowledge and know I've got white oaks I've got red oaks more importantly are they producing are they a size that's going to be producing because if, if your timber is overstocked you're actually suppressing those those trees from producing acorns so you might be better off with that chainsaw and a forester because don't just take your chainsaw into the woods have a plan to open that up to get that canopy open to get that tree some sunlight to allow it to get bigger faster um, because we know that oaks aren't going to start producing until they're probably in that 35 year old category yeah. and if they're suppressed it might be 50 years before they're producing a lot of acorns so cutting a few down in the right place could actually get your timber there faster you know if except okay. from a wildlife standpoint so that's kind of the food aspect of it mm -hmm. um Water, I'm assuming water is an important piece, but because they can move so much? Yes and no. So actually turkeys get a lot of their water through metabolism. So consuming that those foods, the proteins, the greens, they're going to get the water that they need. Most birds will get most of the water they need through what they eat. But free water is always nice to have that creek, to have that stream. They're going to drink, but they don't have to go to it. They don't have to have it on that property. And they can move pretty good distances if they need to. You know, that's kind of interesting. I, it's kind of a, I've always thought in my head, you know, they come down and roost and mate, and right after that, then they're heading to water supply. Mm -hmm. I, that's kind of in my head when I'm out hunting. That's how I've always, and so if I needed to go someplace to find them, I would look for that creek or that water supply because that's where I'd find them. But maybe not. Not necessary. Might be what they're doing because it's available. Uh -huh. and it might be more of a habitat thing, but it's not a necessity. Okay. So you'll see people say, well, I've got to put in a guzzler or I've got to put in a pond for this. Not necessarily. Now, different if we're talking about Rio Grande's, Miriam's out west where water is a limiting factor. And we'll see when people put in guzzling systems in deserts and area, you'll see quail and turkeys and deer and everything go to it because that becomes the free range water source that they might not get up from, from their normal daily activities. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So it changes. In Iowa, water's not an issue. We've got enough creeks, farm ponds, things in southern Iowa that it's not really going to be a limiting factor. Is there anything from a um, roosting standpoint that a landowner could do to that would help so promote? Turkeys are really adaptable to, to trees. Um, again, they, they like, we think of as turkey hunters as that big wolf tree, that tree that's older than anything else, got the big broad branches. But really it gets to the point of anything that they can grasp their feet around. They're gonna get up there at night, lock those tendons in and use that tree as their roost for the night. So as long as you've got a tree that's typically got some um, horizontal branching to it that they can get up into 25 to 30 feet off the ground, they're gonna be happy. But they're gonna be pretty adaptable. They're not gonna get in some five-year-old sapling tree and try to roost in that. They're gonna to move to the neighbor's cottonwood or something down the river bottom. But they're looking for something that provides them nice horizontal structure they can lock on to for the night because it can get pretty windy out there and they've got to be able to, to do that. And then in some cases um, where multiple turkeys can roost in the same tree, especially in the springtime um, when they're when they're trying to congregate to, to, for that first nest or first breeding opportunity in the mornings, they want to roost together. So let's kind of shift to predators, mm -hmm. right? Um, yep. uh, you know, small turkeys, you've talked about small turkeys, mm -hmm. how fragile they are for the first couple weeks. Yeah. Um, what, what's the major killer of turkeys, babies and adults? So from poult standpoint, you know, we always probably, the, it, it depends on what we're talking about. Everything loves eggs. And when I say everything, I mean everything. So we think of raccoons. egg. Raccoons. Well, exactly. Raccoons. We think of those big egg predators. <laughs> raccoons, skunks. What about squirrels? What about snakes? What about crows, blue jays? Everything eats eggs. And Mother Nature accommodates for that. We produce a lot. Everybody tries to nest. We produce you know, 12, 15 eggs per nest, realizing that they're not all going to survive. But any crow that can see a turkey nest is going to go after it. Snakes slithering through the grass are going to try to get it. Foxes are going to try to steal it. It's going to happen. But the darn coons get the majority of it because we got a lot of coons in southern Iowa. Um, it's just part of the equation. So everything loves eggs is my point. As we move through and poults, 
that's going to shift uh, maybe a few more of those mammal predators like your coyotes or your foxes or bobcats because it becomes it's something that's easy at that vulnerable point in time. But at 10 days, that pult's getting off the ground. It's being able to fly and get up and then get off the ground at <laughs> night. Survival rate goes way up. Then we got to worry about things like goshawks and some of those other predators. And that's why turkeys like to have that, that structure over top of their head. And they're always turning and looking up. Turkeys do not like things above their head. So if you're in a deer stand, you're going to see a turkey doing this a lot because it knows you're up there. And it's trying to figure out if you're a predator or not a predator. Um, but then they also have their gang, you know, the, the brooding or the flocking effect where they're all together. And that's a lot of eyeballs looking to keep sure that that movement's not down. And I always joke, deer and, deer and turkeys are best buddies because turkeys see everything and deer smells everything. And if they're together, they're like one big organism. They all know. It, it does seem like if you see deer, you're going to see turkeys mm -hmm. soon after or vice versa. You know? And they use each other yeah. for yep. survival. No doubt about it. Hmm. Yeah. That's good to know. It's not just a good old wise tale. Yeah. So how about nesting? Mm -hmm. uh, nesting habitat. What do, what are they like? So we're in a we're in a unique place in southern Iowa um, because we have all those mixtures of habitat. But what they really tend to want in the old traditional habitat is, and what the what old timers would say is that they're going to be at the base of a big tree, and and we thought that was it. They're going to be at the base of a big tree. What we started to figure out in many of those places is that's what was available, so they were using it. What they really want is something that's protecting their overhead. They want to feel comfortable. So in southern Iowa, you're going to find them in plum thickets, brambles, maybe some big CRP grasses, something that's structurally available to protect them from above and to give them some some feeling that nothing else knows where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. So so we, we you'll find your first nesters of the year by those big trees because there may not be other structure available. But what we find is as turkeys nest and then fail predator breaks up an adult female says i'm not going to give up mother nature says i got to produce young so she'll go and try to have another nest and it seems like then that second nest might be towards something a little greener something a little more open and some of the theory is that she's actually moving towards brooding area so that when that nest comes off it's a less of a movement to that brooding area but it might be that by that time that bramble patch has leafed out and now it's just become a big thicket you know, no self-respecting coyote is going to try to go through that because it's too thick. He can't catch anything in there. So it changes. <laughs> but traditional is it's something that provides some overhead cover to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot of variables and time, season and rotation. But if we had to give, you know, if you had to give landowners two or three tips mm -hmm. on what they could do, to hey, I, I have a few turkeys, but I'd really like to improve the population. Yeah. What what specifically could they do? So so a couple of things I would say is that they've got to take an evaluation on what are they doing and what do they have control over. Because um, if you've got a big piece of timber that doesn't allow you to put in a in a in a green patch or do something, you can't. You may have a limiting factor, something you can't even control. Yeah. But it might be that you've got a big timber that's overstocked. And maybe just thinning it out or just dropping some treetops down. And those treetops become that vertical structure. Now you create better nesting habitat. The one thing that I usually try to recommend to people is, is that we think about turkeys doing fine when it comes to the nesting side is how do we get those poults to survive? And so I want to make sure that we've got some access to some brood habitat. Some greens, some short grasses, some things that allow those birds to move through. And we have an oversupply of these big, tall CRP type grasses, uh, which are good habitats, but maybe not the best. So if you can convert some things into some shorter um, bug producing, flower producing type of habitats, that tends to be a limiting factor on a lot of pieces of property. Yeah. So you've done some good tree stand improvement on your property. I'm just, again, I'm, I'm doing that whole analogy of between our two properties. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've done a lot of good tree stand improvement, which I haven't. Um, I'm in the process of putting in uh, CRP, CP4025. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, but I'm doing, I'm already kind of committed. I'm going to be doing uh, half in really tall grass mm -hmm. and then with Forbes. Mm -hmm. And then the other half's going to be, uh, you know, four foot, four foot grasses or less mm -hmm. with Forbes. Mm -hmm. And it's a good mixture because what we have to realize is we're talking about what do I do for deer and do for turkeys. But I'll guarantee you, you both get a lot of enjoyment out of your property with other things. Sure. Remember the first time I saw a big CRP field full of bobolinks. 
that's a that's a neat sight to see when you see hundreds of nesting bobolinks, and that was a direct response to a CRP planting of tall grasses or the grasses that they needed that weren't there before. So you know we can try to optimize, but what mm-hmm. we really want is we want to just make our, our our space better. Sure. You know, and and hopefully everything else will kind of come with it. You know, we're we're never really going to just produce deer or just produce right. turkeys or just produce, but we're going to make things better. Habitat. Habitat. Come along. Yeah. Habitat. It's awesome. Tim, any other questions you have? You know, you, you mentioned earlier uh, roughed grouse. Mm-hmm. Do we have roughed grouse around here? I... So yes and no. Um, most likely no anymore. There was an attempt back in the 80s to reintroduce grouse, and we did it through Stevens Forest and Shimmick and, and some private properties. And then we've seen those numbers dwindle to the point that I don't think I've had a report in probably three years from people they've heard them so most of our grouse habitat is in northeast iowa okay but we had a reintroduction effort and most likely it failed because we didn't manage our timber that timber matured and we know that grouse don't like mature timber they like early early successional young forest habitat and we introduced them into places that had that Mm -hmm. and then we walked away and 40 years later it's not young young timber anymore so why would we expect the grouse to still be hanging on okay makes sense interesting Mm -hmm. But they're a fun species to see when you're turkey hunting, too. They really are. Jim, is there any, anything we've missed here that, uh, you know, we need to fill in for our audience? on? I, I think we covered most of the season. Just think about your turkeys in that seasonal aspect. Really doing a site evaluation of what is my limiting factor on my property. Be realistic. Is Can I provide all that on my property? If I can't, I've got to go outside and see what is my neighbors or what is the land around me providing that I can't. And, and then I'll just do the best I can with what I've got as part of that landscape to make my overall turkey population better in the area. And then just realizing some of those turkeys will spill off onto me and spill off on other people as well. That's interesting. Interesting. Cool. Anything else? No. no. Awesome. Oh, I know you guys have more questions. We just don't have enough time. <laughs> we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, I want to thank you, Jim, for uh, you know the time and the knowledge and the expertise, and especially the time of year. You know, really, like I said, it's really getting me geared up to get out there and get hunting and. Yeah. And, and build some habitat. I mean, it's perfect time to start doing that. It, it is. And, and, and that's a great segue to what I would say to people is, is that this year when you were talking about, you know, the, the animals were stressed a little bit more because we had a, an odd winter, not typical for southern Iowa. It really hurt our banana production this year in the banana belt is a joke because that's what my colleagues up north call us <laughs> down here. Is that we need to be thinking about that limiting factor. You know, in most years when we put out those cover plots or food plots or whatever you want to call them, the realization is we hope that they're not used, but in the year we need them, we need them. And then fortunately is, is that we need to be thinking about that now. And we don't know what next winter is going to be. And if they don't use it, then just realize all that grain that's on the ground, something's going to use it. That's right. Squirrel's sure. going to use it. Turkey's going to use it. Grouse is going to use it. Something's going to pick it up. And it's still structure. It's still out there providing habitat. So, so be planning is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great time of year. Again, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Until then, be Be safe, safe, have have fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.